We have a uh, special guest this morning in our worship service, a first-timer that's come to be with us for the first time. Where did Randall go, Haley? Did he run off again? Yeah. Randall, you got to come introduce Reed to us. <laughs> he may have walked over to take the kids to the nursery. You think you can do it? So that's not quite two weeks, right? Oh, how about that? Congratulations. We're so glad to have you back. Okay. I, I, I'm waiting to hear a couple of amens from back there, you know, or at least that's what we'll interpret them as anyway, you know, from there. <laughs> okay, this morning we continue looking at the book of Ephesians. Uh, For those of you who study your scriptures, and if you keep up with things, you know where we are today. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 21 through the end of the chapter. And so as you know, that this is that passage of scripture that deals with marriage relationships. So let me tell you right off the bat, those of you who are not married, not looking to be married not even have a boyfriend or a girlfriend at this point in time, do not go to sleep on me because there is a message for you in this as well. For those of you who are married, let me go ahead and say husband and wives, you might want to separate out about three feet, okay? So that way there will be no more elbows, no more pokes, you know, as we go through what the scripture has to tell us about marriage this morning from there. But the the scripture, as I said, is in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. And we're going to look at it kind of verse by verse from there. You say, why do you think that Paul decided to write this and and bring it into the attitude about marriage and, and the relationships from there? Well, maybe it helps us to understand a little bit about what the situation was in the world around them at that time. Because if you looked at the Jews... Uh, the Jewish nation, the relationship between a husband and a wife was, the wife was not a whole lot more than a servant. Uh, she was there for strictly to take care of things. The, the Jewish men would often, when they were saying their prayers in the morning, they would say, God, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile or slave or a woman from there. The Greeks were not a whole lot better. Uh, in the Greek relationship between a husband and wife, there was not even a procedure for a divorce. Uh, it was just something that they could just make happen without giving a whole lot of thought to it. Demosthenes says this. He said, we have courtesans for the sake of pleasure. We have concubines for the sake of daily cohabitation. And we have wives for the purpose of having children legitimately and being guardians for our household affairs. During, for the Greeks during this particular time, there was a lot of both male and female prostitution. The Greek term for prostitution and unchastity is where we get our word for pornography. Husbands, they had their concubines and their prostitutes. Wives, they had their slaves, both male and female. Prostitution, homosexuality, and other forms of sexual promiscuity and perversion led to even widespread cases of child abuse in the Greek society. The Roman society was even worse. Marriage was little more than legalized prostitution. Uh, Divorce was a single piece of paper formality. Many women during the time of the Romans did not want to have children because they did not want it to mess up the way their bodies looked from there. Feminism was growing rampant as far as the Romans are concerned. Uh, Women started to state that they could do anything that a man could do. Most of them took up, or many of them took up things like sword fighting and wrestling. Uh, they said that they would uh, really, one of their favorite sports was running naked through the woods, chasing wild boars, you know. They began to lord everything over men, even initiating divorce, which was totally unheard of. So the situation at that time was that there was not a whole lot of respect between husband and wives. Marriage was in deep trouble. 
Uh, it was not given this proper place and perspective in people's lives. I'm not so certain that we're a whole lot different. Still, even though over the last year, the, the, the percentage of divorces or number of divorces actually has come down the latter part of the year after we entered into the, the pandemic, uh, even though it rose up dramatically at the beginning of it. They say the reason that is is because people are so concerned about uncertainty, they're not willing to add another uncertainty into it. But they expect that it will go back to its 43%, which is basically the percentage of marriages that, of first marriages that will fail. The problem is that people view marriage as not a commitment, but kind of a contract, you know, an agreement uh, that has an, a beginning point and can end very easily just by breaking the contract. Uh, we, 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 we enter into marriage too often with an exit plan. We're going to get married, but if this doesn't work out, you know, we can always get a divorce from there. It's an easy preparation, no preparation going in and an easy out coming out. So Paul wrote to address that because people of the time saw the belief of Scripture and what was being taught about the relationship between a husband and a wife to be a challenge to their very climate, so to speak, their very culture. And so he felt like he needed to write and to reiterate exactly what it was, what the, what the Scriptures taught, what God had said, and to explain it to the people. We have the same circumstance in our lives here today because to much of the world, what the Bible teaches us, God's ways are, are deemed to be out of touch, irrelevant, uh, and offensive to what people want to do. I mean, after all, didn't the Bible tell us that you know, the gospel would be offensive because it would be challenged people at what they wanted to do? But Paul's words, that then and now, we're to instruct believers that we are supposed to live in total contrast to the corrupt, vile, self-centered, immoral standards of the world. Just as if we needed to be reminded. So let's look at how the scripture says. Verse 21 begins by saying, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Whew. That, is a, that is an ugly word as far as our world is concerned. We don't believe in submitting, you know, uh, because, you know, we believe that if you submit, that you have failed. If you submit, you have given up. If you submit, that you have decided that you are a loser. If you submit. Everybody, everything in this world, I, in my opinion, what I see, everybody says, you know, what I say, what I think, what I do, who I am is the only thing that matters. You know, I'm not submitting to anybody you know, at all. It's, I, I, I was in a, uh, uh, a restaurant one day and, and I saw a guy had on a t-shirt, a shirt. And on the front of it, it said, resist. You know, resist. And I said, what are you resisting? He said, everything. You know, everything. And I think that's part of the problem in our world right now is we're resisting everything, you know, from there. We talk about the, the, the number of people that have, 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 have engaged with police and have wound up getting shot. And you wonder, what made a person ever think that the right thing to do when a police officer says for you to, to put down your weapon or to stop doing what you're going to do, you know, or to get out of the car or whatever instructions do you, that it was a smart thing to say, I ain't going to do that, you know? Because we believe that we have the right to resist anything. And there are some things that we need to resist. We need to resist sin. We need to resist things that are immoral, things that are illegal. But you don't just resist everything. But see, <clears throat> if I ask you to give me eight words that describe submission, six of them would probably be terribly offensive. Two of them might be slightly acceptable, you know, from there. But our mindset and our counselor today is that we don't submit to nothing. But I would have you understand that uh, you submit to a lot of things already. You go to the doctor, 
The doctor says, this is what's wrong with you. You need to do this. Do you say, well, I ain't going to do that. No, you submit to the doctor. Why? Because the doctor has more knowledge of the circumstances. Well, most of the time, the doctor has more knowledge of the circumstances than you do. You know? That what he is telling you to do is for your best interest. Your car breaks down, you go to a garage that you trust. Remember, the first thing we want to do is go someplace that we trust. And the mechanic says, you need this. Are you going to say, well, no, I don't think we need that. Just throw some oil on it and it'll go a little further. You know? No, you trust him because he has more knowledge and knows what is best for your vehicle. This is what submit means, is that you willingly place yourself, you rank yourself under another. You rank yourself under another. Now, we're going to explore that a little bit. But maybe before we get to this next verse, which this is the one where the elbow poking comes, it says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord. You know, now, let me point out something to you about this verse. It's not a command. It's not a command. The verbiage and the way that the, the word is used is not a command, okay? It is a pointing out that you need to make a willingly voluntary choice. A choice to submit. And who's the submission to? Your own husband. Not to men as general, but to your own husband. And how do you do that? As you do to the Lord. That's your voluntary response. You know, let me ask you this. If you have problems with the idea of submitting, what is your relationship with the Lord? Because we learn submission from our relationship to the Lord. We learn submission from the example of Jesus because he was the ultimate example of submission when he submitted to the sacrificing of himself on the cross so that we might be benefited by that and through that we might be saved. But we need to be able to say, hear that whole thing, submit to your own husbands as you do the Lord. I read an article by John Piper, and he was preaching the similar sister verse to this, which comes from 1 Peter, uh, about wives submitting to their husbands. And he said, you know, one thing we need to understand right off the bat, that there are six things that submission is not. Submission is not. Submission is, first of all, not agreeing to agree on everything. It doesn't mean that you cannot have disagreements over things. You know, you didn't, wives, you may not have to agree with every opinion your husband has, even on things as fundamental and serious as your Christian faith. I mean, you, you don't have to. God made you with a mind. He made you with the ability to think. You're a person, a body, and not a machine. And so you don't necessarily have to agree with everything your husband says. Secondly, submission does not mean leaving your brain at the altar because God created you as an intelligent person. You know, and when we get married, you know, as men, we, we've quickly realized that we have uh, joined into a relationship with an independent mental center that has thoughts that are worth listening to when we thought we were the only ones that had thoughts, you know? But our spouses are worth listening to because God made them that way. Submission does not mean that you do not try to influence your husband. You know, probably as someone who's been married for more than he's not been married, I've learned that I need to listen to my wife because she sometimes makes a whole lot more sense than I do, you know, from there. I can say that because she's not here this morning, you know, and I don't have to have her repeat it back to me. But, you know, we, we are able, and particularly that scripture in 1 Peter was talking about a husband who was not a believer, you know, a husband who was not a believer in Christ. And we know that submission is not putting the will of your husband before the will of Christ. You're not required to submit to your husband if he tells you to do something that's unbiblical or sinful or not in God's plan for your life. Submission also does not mean getting all of your spiritual strength from your husband. He cannot be the only influence spiritually in your life. 
And lastly, submission does not mean living or acting in fear. In fear. And we know that has been a lot in the news and all lately. Let me tell you this. No husband has been given the authority to say, the Bible commands that you must submit. It never makes that command. Remember when it says, wives, submit to your husbands, it is not a command. And if you as a husband have to resort to saying that, you know, at that point, I don't think that you have understood what it means to love your wives as Christ loves the church. Because the relationship of a husband and wife is not a master-slave relationship. It is a coexisting equal relationship. Look at verse 23. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. So what does head mean? We all, guys, we have, we have interpreted that to mean we are the grand poobah. You know, we are the final say in everything. But you know what head really means? It means responsibility. That means is we as husbands have responsibility for our families. It doesn't mean that we are the boss or the grand poobah. It means that we are to have responsibility. Now, verse 24 says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Why does the church submit to Christ? Why do believers submit to God's word and to Christ? We submit because we know it is for our well-being. It is for his purpose and his plan for our lives. We submit sometimes even though we don't understand what's going on. We don't understand why the path is going the direction that it has. But we trust Christ. We trust him because we know that everything he does, every plan that he has for us is to benefit us and to bless us, not to harm us. And so you can walk through that process without being afraid. You know that he's not going to harm us. And he gave himself up for us. He sacrificed himself. So why? So that we would be holy and blameless. We would be better and we would be right. And see, his relationship with the church is not one of commands. It's a relationship of invitations. It's not a relationship of demands. It's a relationship of sacrifice. It isn't forced to us. It isn't demanded. It isn't commanded. And it's by grace through faith that we're able to submit ourselves to Christ. You know, one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. But on the day, that will only be on the day of judgment. And that will occur when, when too many people will realize too late that they've been bowing the knee to the wrong God, the God of this world. And until that day, though, God is patient with us not desiring that any should perish. He is patient with us, working in our lives, helping us to grow. See, submission is the calling. It is a calling upon your life and my life as a believer. We need to escape from the world's thought that tries to impose on relationships. The world tries to tell us what a relationship looks like and how they should work. And we need to separate from that and trust only God's plan because he laid one out for us. For that relationship. We need to, to see that. As us being in submission. Not a place of inferiority. Not a place of unequalness. But a place of equality before God. Believers voluntarily place themselves. Under the submission to Christ. And according to God's plan. It is possible for a wife to voluntarily place herself under submission to her husband according to God's plan. It's what he laid out for us. But for this to be possible, okay, now all that said, for this to be possible, there's another part of the plan that has to take place. It's that part that sees how God will equip husbands to be the men of God that he has called them to be. Let's go back to verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives 
just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, wives, you might want to underline that verse because this is the only command in this passage of Scripture. You were asked to voluntarily submit yourself to your husband as unto the Lord. But men are told, love your wives. That is a command. That's not something that we have a choice in. We need to love as Christ commands. How do we do it? As Christ loved the church. And what did Christ do for the church, for his believers? He died for us. And we need to have that same level of love for our spouses from there. And it's, 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 it's really, you know, we as men, we need instructions, okay? We need step by step. You know, if you want me to do something, tell me how to do it. And so the scripture doesn't leave that alone. It tells us how. How do we do it? As Christ loved the church. That's how we love our wives. But what does that mean? It means less action and more attitude. It means how we see that relationship. It's not about power. It's not about authority. But it's about responsibility. We have the responsibility for our families. You know, you love regardless of your wife's behavior or health condition or appearance. You commit no matter what deterrence and difficulties show up. You deny yourself time and resources and self-gratification. And we need the strength of Christ to help us never give up loving our wives as Christ loved the church. What kind of love's involved there? Well, there are really several different kinds. One is sacrificial love. There's sacrificial love. And that sacrificial love is founded in grace. Christ loved the unlovely and the unworthy. His love for us is not based on anything we are or anything that we do. It's based simply on the fact that he chose to give us his love. He chose to love us. You know, the world's idea of love is object-oriented. You know, we, 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 we worship and we love physical looks and, and personality and wit and prestige and power. You know, the world loves whom it deems worthy of love. You've seen that if you, if you stay on social media. You know, people rise and fall depending on how much the world loves them. Some of us try to figure out why it loves them in the first place. But when we base it on objects or looks or all these other things, once those things are gone, the love goes as well. That's yesterday's news. It's all gone. That kind of love is fickle. It's not love that will last. First, that's God, God loves because the object of his love is us, and we need it. We need it. First Thessalonians 4 says, Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. See, love is, love is an emotion, but love is primarily a matter of choice. You choose to love, you know, just like you can choose to hate. You choose to love. The emotional attachment, the emotional love will come and go. But if you choose to love, that stays forever. James 2.8 says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. 1 John 3.7 says, dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does right is righteous, just as he, Christ, is righteous. We need to love as Christ loved the church, without thought for well-being, but sacrifice and blessing for those. Not for power and authority, but taking responsibility for our families and our relationship. God expects you men. He expects you men to accept the spiritual responsibility for your family. God expects you men to lead those in your care on a spiritual journey to help your family grow in their relationship with Christ. God expects you men to be active in helping other people come to a relationship with Christ. That's what headship is. That's what being the head means. Loving God and loving others is just as much an act of the will as it is of the emotion. Verse 26 says, what's the purpose of sacrificial love? 
He says to present her, talking about the church, as a to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And in this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. That is the second kind of love. That is the caring love. The caring love. As we take care of our own bodies, we, when, we need, when she needs strength, we share strength. When she needs wisdom, we share wisdom. When she needs encouragement, we share with, uh, encouragement. We need to understand that our wives are a God-given treasure to be loved and cared for and nourished and cherished cherished what does it mean to cherish someone that's not a word we use a lot those of us who are old and were teenagers the same amount were there was a there was a song called cherish you know and that's the one song that we would get all googly eyed to our girlfriends as it came on the radio and you know lean over there and put our head on their shoulder and you know let her know that's how we feel about it it was a good song you know from there but what does it mean webster says it means to hold dear to keep or cultivate with care and affection. To hold dear. So how, how can we cherish our spouses? Well, this guy did a survey of women and came up with a number of things that we as men can do to make our wives realize that we cherish them. Now feel free to write these down. Post them on the refrigerator. Or maybe you need to post them somewhere your wife can't see them, you know, so she can't check them off. First of all, you need to make time for her consistently. You know, when we're dating, we spend a lot of time. We spend time preparing for the weekend when we go out on dates. We spend a lot of time preparing for that date, you know. All this sort of stuff and, and a lot of time for that, that woman in our life. But once we are married, not so much. You know, we need to make it time that's dedicated exclusively for her. Time that, that, that keeps the dating going on. You know, it keeps the dating going on so that she'll never feel taken for granted. Secondly, we need to appreciate her for all the things that she does that makes life better for everyone. Most of our spouses do so many things that we, they, we never recognize that they do because it, it just makes things work. Third, we need to acknowledge her. Look for those things that she does and tell her you appreciate them. Don't look for those things that you can criticize. Look for those things that you can bless. Fourth, accept her for who she is. Grasp the, the best version of herself instead of reminding her of her flaws. You know, there's no need to change her. There's no, 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 or, or to even wish she were different. What is the statement I've told many, many brides before, looking at the other side of this? If that man that you're marrying, if you think you can marry him and change him, you need to back away from this in a hurry because you ain't going to change him. What you see is what you get. And when we look at our wives, we look at our brides, we need to realize that she is perfect just as she is. You know, society has created an ideal mold that it believes all women are supposed to fit in. They're supposed to look a certain way, you know, they're supposed to dress a certain way in order to do this, that, or the other. And often they feel pressured into it and, and pressured to conform by the media and news and, and magazines and, and culture. But it should not be so with us as husbands. We need to tell her you love her unconditionally and completely for who she is. Because after all, isn't that who you married? And there's no improvement needed on this site. We need to cultivate compassion. Work at understanding your challenges. <laughs> We have men with difficulties that, but we need to try to understand the difficulties that our spouses are facing in their lives. The things that are challenges to them. Walk a mile in their shoes. Compassion is being there for her, being empathetic and considerate. We need to offer a listening ear. I mean, women talk on the average a whole lot more than men do, you know. They talk about the things that they feel, the things that are going on in their lives and going through that process. That's their way of, of expressing feelings. We need to learn to listen. This is the hardest lesson I ever had to learn as a husband. We need to learn to listen without trying to fix the situation, without trying to solve the problem or helping them troubleshoot what's going on. 
Because see, what happens if we take that approach to it, before she ever gets through telling you what's going on and what the challenge is, you're already working on four steps to solve the issue. I can't tell you how many times Kathy's told me, I didn't want you to fix it, I just wanted you to listen to it. Of course, as men, we want to say, how can I not fix it? You know, how can I not fix it? We need to let our wives know that they have been heard by us. We need to show openness and honesty. We need to be able to have honest communication with our wives. We need to be able to have discussions that involve more than sports and news. Deep thought and intimate thoughts. Those bring out a feeling of safety when you can broach those subjects with your spouse. We need to be vulnerable. Now, your spouse doesn't need to know about every fear or worry that you have, but they do need to know about the challenges that you're facing. Because I promise you guys, they already know something's going on. What's in this takeaway for me? What am I supposed to learn here? I'll go back to verse 21. And what does it say? It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It doesn't make a difference what relationship and what person you're talking about. Because submission means that we view other people as more important than ourselves. It doesn't mean that we put ourselves down. It means we elevate them up because we see them as what they are, which is God's creations. And we would not dare look down upon one of God's creations. I mean, after all, can you see yourself looking at a peacock and saying, Well, God, that's pretty good, but I think you could have done better. You know, no. We look at every human being that walks on the face of the earth. It doesn't make any difference whether it's a man or a woman. It doesn't make any difference what its race, what its religion, what its nationality is. That person is a creation of God. And we cannot look down upon them. And we submit ourselves through the love of Christ. Because he was the ultimate example of submission for us. So that's the key, no matter what your position is. Is that we understand what submission means. And submission is not being a prisoner. It's not being second rate. It's not being not as important. It is a decision that you make in order to be in the middle of God's plan for your life, whether in your personal life or in your married life or whatever. God's plan is submission to Him first and then to submit to others in the same way that we submit to Him. It doesn't belittle us. In fact, it makes us greater because it puts us in the center of God's will. So let me ask you today, you're submitting to something You're submitting to something. And it may have nothing to do with God. But let me tell you, you need to make sure you're submitting to the right thing, the right person, the only one that matters, the only one that guarantees eternal life for you, the only one that has a plan, a plan for you to succeed, the only one that is worthy of our submission. And that is our Father in heaven from there. Make your marriage stronger. Make your relationship stronger by understanding what God's plan for you is. I challenge you as married couples, as soon to be married couples, not even want to get married couples, to sing God's plan. Give Him the glory and He will exalt you from that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a plan that doesn't always coincide with what our plan is, which means it is a whole lot better. Pray, Lord, that we might have strength, courage to live as you would want us to, that you would guide us, teach us, lift us up. Use us, Father, in any way you see fit to glorify yourself. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing this together this morning. Would you sing this with me?
Jesus is tenderly calling you home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will you roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring him your burden and you shall be blessed. He will not turn you away. Calling today. Thank you for being here this morning. Let me give you a couple of announcements just to remind you of, of a couple of upcoming things. Uh, parents, we are planning for a uh, child parent dedication on Mother's Day, May the 9th. And so if you haven't called the church office and let us know uh, that you'd like to participate in this, and this is just not, not just for, for infants you know, or, or newborns or anything like that. Some of you may have children that you joined the church and they were not participating in, a, in, a, in a, a dedication service for parents and children. You're more than welcome if they have not been to participate in that. If you just let us know so we can prepare for that. Also, men, don't forget the bass fishing tournament that's coming up on uh, uh, May the 15th. Uh, the information is in there on the cost and how to sign up for that as well. And I hope you'll plan on being a part of that uh, in, in the days to come. Vacation Bible School is coming up in June. And I'm, they're going to meet today, right, at uh, uh, 4 o'clock. Uh, if you have not uh, uh, committed to work in Vacation Bible School, you need to, uh, because it's a great opportunity for us to be able to do this again this year, uh, as far as Bible School is concerned. And uh, you'll be blessed in the times that you can uh, participate in that as well. Also, uh, Christy, where are you? She can do this better than I can. Well, she can do a lot of things better than I can, but she can do this better than I can. Well, I know that. Let me answer. All right. Um, good morning. On May 6th, Corey, I don't know if there's a slide. On May 6th, it's in your bulletin, um, we are doing a shower of love for Heather and Damon Poole. Um, they are preparing to become foster parents. And so we as a church are going to love on them and help them get all of the supplies and everything that you need um, for preparing for foster care. So. I'm sorry, is there not? Okay, sorry, there's not a slide. Um, they are registered at Amazon and Walmart. They are preparing for kids newborn through seven years old. But in addition to their registries, they also need toys, books, puzzles, things that kids need to be kids. Um, so please just um, love on them. It's May 6th, 6 30 in the youth room. If you have any questions, you can come talk to me um, or Monica. She's not here this morning, or Heather and Damon. But Okay. Thanks, Chris. So I hope you'll come back and join us tonight. Uh, we continue tonight to look at the book of Ruth. Uh, we've had a good time as we've begun going through that study. And it's, I've, I've learned how many people tell me that's their favorite book of the Bible, you know, from there. And so uh, uh, we're going to be looking at that. We'll, we'll have that tonight. So I hope you come and join us there. Hope you have a great week. Hope God will find a particular way to use you this week so that you might bless somebody else, that you might serve someone else through your relationship with the Lord. Let's pray and then we're going to sing. Father, we thank you so much for loving us and caring for us. Thank you for your patience and compassion upon us with the struggles we go through in life. But we know, Lord, that you never turn loose of our hands. You always never walk away from us. You're always there strengthening, guiding, and blessing if we keep our eyes on you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this together as we're dismissed this morning. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. 
Dismiss this one.